everyone, it's Holmes from Holmes Storybooks and today I am here to share with you the first part of my 20th century queer project. I started reading in, in the 1970s and I read 11 books, one for each year in the decade plus a spare. I'll go in order of years, starting with The Lord Won't Mind by Gordon Merrick. A funny story about this book, right before Christmas I was flying to Montreal from my hometown which is about a four hour flight with the flight starting at six in the morning. Understandably, I wanted some books that would be attention grabbing and easy to read because the flight was gonna be packed early and a brutal slog with not much to entertain me. So I ordered a few super smutty erotica books to entertain me, recommended to me by a very popular and accomplished YouTuber. I was right, the flight was packed to the gills with everyone's massive suitcases, gifts, and winter coats. So I settled down to read my books. They were all right, but they weren't as great as I was hoping. And one of them was marked as a new adult erotica book, but it only got smutty 70% of the way in. So I gave up and I thought I would try The Lord Won't Mind by Gordon Merrick, my book for 1970. Even if I just read for like 10 minutes, at least I'd start on another book and gradually chip away at the 80 something books I have to read. And oh boy, I was not expecting very explicit sex scenes between the two main characters, Charlie and Peter, immediately. It put my new adult smut to shame, it really did. It thrilled me, I laughed so hard. It really does feel like a blend of sex definitely sells and also the only place men can have safe intimate sex is in fiction on a page, so I'll just write lots of it. Alexander the Great and Hephaestion, who? Never heard of him. Only heard of Peter and Charlie. I loved it. Until the misogyny and awful racism, of course, which tends to be a bit of a theme in this project, a theme I had anticipated, but is nonetheless not fun to encounter. Charlie is a pig. I hate him. I really, truly loathed him. He's racist, sexist, homophobic, and a pretentious snob. Anytime there's a marginalized character, a queer man, a woman, a black person, you can be guaranteed Charlie will say something awful and almost entirely without provocation. Peter is not as bad. Initially, he's a doormat until the two move to New York and are separated for various reasons. I liked Peter's character a lot more. There's something magnetic about him. How he is unapologetically queer, more flamboyant, more camp, more celebratory of his love, himself and his peers. He really is a character quite ahead of his time. While Charlie is obsessed with money, work, and financial security, Peter doesn't mind money much at all and knows he'll find his way. While Charlie is racist against black people at every turn, Peter often finds himself in Harlem at blues clubs and parties, creating friendships, dating, and financially supporting queer black men. While Charlie is obsessive over the projection of his life and his family's view of him, Peter is rather apologetically happy to cut out anyone out of his life that doesn't agree with him. I suppose there is a discussion one could have around Charlie's character and how familial expectations and toxic masculinity are what made his character really truly terrible, but he did such reprehensible things, truly, that I don't care about Merrick's discussion around these topics. Like, there's so much here and I just don't care because Charlie's an asshole and even if his traits are necessary, who cares? I'd read a book about Peter again, perhaps, but never Charlie. Even though this book starts as a trilogy, I won't be continuing it. Up until this book, many of the books published about gay men didn't have happy endings. In fact, one of the ways to make sure the books were published was to punish the characters enough for their indiscretions. Books like Ian Forster's Morris, admittedly what I wanted when I selected this book, was written in 1913 and would remain unpublished for years, not only because it was gay, but because it ended well for both characters. Merrick dead in 1970 to give two gay men a happy ending. Odd that I, a real romantic, didn't want a happy ending for Charlie and Peter. If you want a book like this, consider Ian Forster's Morris, which also stars a blonde, beautiful, slightly pretentious man and his unapologetically queer lover, but is far superior. Huge big trigger warnings for racism, racial slurs, rape, homophobia, homophobic slurs, domestic violence, abuse, there's a particularly bad scene around 70% of the way through the book, and ugh. Anyway, Charlie sucks. That's all for this review. Let's move on to the next book. So my book for 1971 is On Being Different, What It Means to Be Homosexual by Mel Miller. 
Do I go into how Mel Miller's essay was a response to a homophobic article published by Harper's written by Joseph Epstein? Do I go into the fact that this seemingly mild-mannered, well-educated writer, biographer, and war correspondent was, quote, sick and tired of reading and hearing so much goddamn demeaning, degrading bullshit about me and my friends, unquote? In both the forward and afterward, written respectively by Dan Savage, which was really my least favorite part of the book, and Charles Kaiser, they speak of his anger, but first I noticed Miller's tenderness, his gentleness, I heard his pleas, he saw queer activists organizing, becoming militant in their demand for rights, and immovable in the face of bigotry. But he felt, despite taking part in meetings and speaking with them, that he couldn't force himself to be so uncompromising. He wanted to be respected, liked, loved, even. And it shows. The essay itself is very readable, very accessible, even if some of the historical context, names, and protests went over my head. Miller's quips about everyone worrying about homosexual sons when no one's thought about lesbian daughters or lesbians at all, for that matter, had me laughing. Lesbian culture has been shot down historically from people in power for thousands of years. People simply refused to acknowledge it existed. Queen Victoria refused to even entertain the idea. Hitler also refused to believe it was a thing, which meant that lesbian culture, bars, zines, and dating scenes flourished during World War II in Berlin. The American military at the time, while having questions about men's sexual preferences, never asked women the same questions, and as a result, the unmarried and childless women who joined the military were often queer. So the fact that Mel was like, is nobody going to think of the lesbians? was hilarious, especially considering he then only talks uh, from his experience, which in his defense is more than fair. So yes, Miller was angry, but he was a great many other things besides. To hear him speak of E.M. Forster as someone he communicated with in real life was a darling moment. E.M. Forster really does feel far, far away from me. It's nice to know he was not so far. Perhaps the most beautiful thing about Miller's essay is that what happened to him happened to many of us. We could no longer shoulder the burden of being closeted, despite the risks Despite the eventual fallout amongst friends, family, and loved ones, he came out. He had no choice, so he came out at 52 after being married, divorced, and working as a writer. Stunning, but not surprising, that this revolutionary essay should receive a little more than a cursory mention in his Wikipedia article. And so, rather than see his anger, I saw a man who was tired of carrying his burden, set it down, and in amongst the veritable turmoil caused by his article, found his friends amongst the crowd, and what an admirable thing he did. Trigger warnings for mentions of racial slurs and queer slurs. And let's move on to the next book. My book for 1972 is The Men with Pink Triangle by Heinz Herger. So when I read this book a few years ago, I left it with a review to come, quote unquote, because I really did still have to process my feelings on it. However, here we are several years later, my review still unwritten until now, and when I realized this book was published in 1972, I had to include it for this project. This is a first-hand account of a gay man, Yosef Kohut, pseudonym Heinz Hager, who survived the persecution and internment of gay men in Nazi Germany in a camp called Sachsenhausen. Kohut was arrested in March 1939, aged 24, when a Christmas card he had sent to his male lover, Fred, was intercepted. Fred, whose father was a high-ranking high ranking Nazi official, was deemed mentally disturbed and escaped punishment. Kohut was in the camp from 1939 until 1945, when the camps were liberated. The author's prose is described as sparse, and being that the book is 120 pages, I guess you could say that it is sparse, but that doesn't really quite have the emotional connotation that I wanted to have. His prose is brutal, economical, effective, naked, forthright. After the camps were liberated, many of the queer men were sent back to prison in their home countries because homosexuality was still a crime, and Herger's writing reflects that. The tone of the book is sharp, distressing, honest, and sometimes even cold. But then, on the other hand, it is intensely warm and compassionate and revealing. Some of the parts of this book are told with such a frank, distant recollection, and then other parts are tender and almost paternal. One of my favorite parts of the book remains when Herger decides to tell his mother about his homosexuality. 
not because he's afraid he'll be caught, but because he wants to unburden himself of the secret he, he no longer wants to keep. And when I talk about coming out with a lot of people, I use Herger's way of coming out in order to describe. I still think of passages from this book long after I've read it. At the time, I felt like it was going to be a really difficult book to review because the content was so valuable, but the writing itself was just so stark and severe and unambiguous. But I remember so much from it. I remember so many cool truths Herger discussed, from the genocidal history of the camps to Germany's cool indifference in giving its queer survivors no compensation for Hitler's inhumane treatment of the camp's prisoners. Interestingly though, it is such an important book and is often discussed in universities, particularly in Germany, but it was difficult for me to find here. I had to request it from another library and then from there it took six to eight weeks to come in. A lot of the information on the author himself is in German and there's not much to his Wikipedia page. The page does speak about what he endured, his work as an activist in trying to get the German government to acknowledge the pain and suffering of queer men during that time and his legacy. However, one does have to wonder if the erasure of his and the other queer men suffering during this time really had a lasting effect on how much information, how many accounts survived, and what we know about the treatment of queer men in Nazi concentration camps. This is not for the faint of heart at all. There are so many de details of starvations, hangings, beatings, dead bodies. It's, yeah, it's hard, it's tough, it's unrelenting. This seems like Herger's one chance to speak his truth, so he speaks it. There's a steeliness to his words, as if he will not allow anyone to counter or challenge his account. There are actually a few inconsistencies to his account, but I'm not going to go into those, and I don't think it's worth it. There was only one time when I really wanted to put this book down, and I felt the scene was just too intense to read, but otherwise, I did get through it. Staying as a witness really had a lasting effect on me, despite the style of writing really being a thing I don't normally enjoy, though I don't think you can say you can enjoy a book like this. If you're looking for something similar or are curious about this topic but don't want to start with something quite as brutal as this, Richard Plant's book The Pink Triangle, The War Against Homosexuals is a great start. It references this key text and many others, it also provides more historical context and was actually a really delightful read. Either way, I'm grateful I read this book, and I'm grateful for Yosef's legacy. My book for 1973 was the infamous Ruby Fruit Jungle by Rita Mae Brown. Ruby Fruit Jungle is all about Molly Bolt, a little girl who grows up in a trailer and is a bastard in her tiny small town. In the first half, Molly, the protagonist, is precocious, scrappy, and fierce. She has the backbone at 8 that I wish I had at 26 or 27. She is a tour de force, unforgiving, uncompromising, and ready to take you out behind the shed and fist fight you if you disagree with her. She's tough. And she survived growing up in a nowhere town in middle America, poor and a bastard child. It's a story about an unfinished American dream, one where the protagonist rose above the trappings of her upbringing to triumph. Brown's messages are clear to anyone who needs to hear them and is queer. You are spectacular, you are brilliant, be bold, and I ate it up like bread and butter. In the second half of the novel, the tone really changes. Molly is hardened, jaded, and tired. She is terribly queerphobic to butchers in a bar in more than one scene. When approached by butchers in a bar and flirted with, she's terribly unkind and pulls apart gender roles, asking why she has to identify as femme or butch except that her argument really falls apart a bit because butchers and femmes already subvert those traditional gender roles of male and female by virtue of both parties not identifying as cis men. I suspect Molly's reaction to those butchers had everything to do with the fact that she is probably demisexual on the spectrum of asexuality, where someone needs a big emotional connection with someone to enjoy sex, rather than anything to do with, like, butchers. But still, Molly, leave butchers alone. Just because you're demisexual does not mean you get to be an arsehole. Just because you don't enjoy the desirability politics of bars does not mean you get to lash out at members of your own community. But there's the rub. In the second half of the novel, as well as the first, there's always this feeling that Molly is singular. She is alone. Alone in her strength, her talent, her willpower. She has no community. She's the president of her students' association at her university, the only female film student, even when she goes to New York, it's still her against the world, 
sitting in those rotting honeycombs she calls apartments. Molly struggled to accommodate other people with other identities different to her own to compromise really begins to show in the second half of the novel. And looking at reviews on Goodreads, maybe the critics of this book reached to this part of her character to say why they didn't like the book. But still, I loved her and I cheered for her. The ending was unexpected. Her ferocity was unrelenting. There will never be another Molly book. Trigger warnings for rape, incest, queer phobia, slurs, and I feel like there's some other stuff in there that I can't quite remember right now. But let's move on to my book for 1974. My book for 1974 is Child of the Sun by Kyle Onstott. Perhaps it wasn't super well suited because although it was written in 1974, it was set in ancient Rome. But in my defense, this particular one was recommended to me by Marlon James. It says, quote, this was a literary trash with a capital T. Lazy, ridiculous, preposterous, and so smutty that the plot was pretty much using and to bridge sex scene after sex scene. But here's the secret to gay trash. It was about the only kind of literature that dared to propose that man-man lust could be just fun without the sense that one day you would pay for it with your life, unquote. Well, heck, sign me up. I love smut. I love pulp. I love low-brow fiction. I love the idea of shunning a bestseller or a word list just for a little while, just to read something fun for shits and giggles. I especially like it if it's bad. I expected something like the 1979 Caligula film. Lots of wine, nudity, atmosphere, pointless plots surrounded by characters I found irritating but adored anyway. And uh, I got something just kind of weird. The smut wasn't really smutty, it was more of an X and Y fell into each other's arms and scene. It was like a cross between Game of Thrones and Monty Python, which makes it sound great, but it was really nonsense, and I couldn't follow or remember anyone's names. The author had this odd way of writing that really interfered with how I read and reacted to the story. The author would write pages and pages of like, quote, Julia thought she should do this thing. She did the thing. She thought about this person while she did the thing. Here are her motivations. Motivation 1, spurred on by Motivation 2, and of course we mustn't forget Motivation 3. So Julia went and talked to this person, and this person said, I won't do the thing because reasons. Now Julia was incensed. How dare this person refuse her? Unquote. Who were these people? Why was everyone just talking secretly about each other? Why couldn't they have an actual conversation? But I kept on reading because the parts that the author was good at writing was some of the romantic aspects of the book how the main character, Varius, then Antonius, fell in love with a man as soon as their eyes met, I was swooning. And then it happened 17 times. And then I realized he was a baby. He was 14 when all of this was happening, which means that he was being groomed to have sex with all types of men. And wow, underage sex. Okay, all right, thanks Kyle Onstart. But I suddenly understood a lot of a lot more of his behaviors and felt more compassionately towards him and then Antonius then Caesar met the love of his life and suddenly it was good I'm a big romantic heart on my sleeve love when people meet and fall in love perfection Antonius as a character matured he was smart clever thoughtful he was quick and resourceful and adapted to his environment it was like a historical fiction thriller who was trying to kill Caesar, and how would we outwit them? Who's lying? Who's telling the truth? That part of the book, from about 44% of the way in to about 70% of the way in to the book, is the best part. Onstott writes a great, pulpy, addictive, if slightly camp and over-the-top, dramatic historical fiction novel. And then it just got weird again. We had an Oedipus moment, and then everything started to feel contrived again. Felt like the author lost his momentum. I was really tired. I skim read the last quarter of this novel because I really felt like it didn't have any value. There were also just like hastily abandoned plot points where the author was like, oh, and Tony's decided not to kill this person. Like, okay, then why did you just spend six chapters having him plan the whole murder for him to just abandon it? I do not understand. I came into this book wanting pomp and drama and sex, and instead I got an overwritten, nonsensical, tired book. I wanted weddings and coronations and divine settings. I wanted gods, goddesses and champions. I wanted chariot races and courtly intrigue and mysterious oracles. I wanted prophecies and hauntings and sex and instead I got the author telling me how the book would end halfway through for no particular reason at all. I'm a big fan of pulp but not of this book. Let's move on to my book for 1975.
My book for 1975 was The Female Man by Joanna Russ. I read this as a buddy read on Instagram with some lovely people and it was yet another queer feminist sci-fi book that I read for book club that despite its high ratings from people I trust, I did not like. It was dry, it was mean, it was hard, it was boring. It was written in such like a masculine spa style of the 1970s, which I suppose could be a big like F you to all the major publishers of the time. It was convoluted, confusing, and sometimes exclusionary. I found it difficult to follow along at times. Who was the narrator? In whose world were they now? Where were they going? Why was the author using I but then referring to themselves in third person? It was oddly unimaginative for a book that promised aliens and utopias and reimagined worlds. For a book that also promised to discard gender roles and challenge the gender binary, it, uh, it was obsessed with the gender binary and it was uh, pretty transphobic. If there's one thing I could live with my life never seeing again, it's trans people being referred to by their genitals or having their genitals described in detail. I think Russ's writing in this case personifies a lot of what I dislike about second wave feminism, transphobic, often without realizing, reductive, and unimaginative. I liked Laura, I liked when certain characters had to navigate sexist conversations. Those were always well written, relevant still, and alarming in their accuracy. She was a see you next Tuesday, he was a prick, and like, okay. Angry, biting, fierce, and furious. While reading, I'd often tip my head up and ask, what exactly was your point here, Joanna? I'm left having that question unanswered. My relationship with queer feminist sci-fi continues, becoming more and more difficult, and if it hadn't have been for the lovely people in that Instagram chat, I would have put the book down and not finished it, I think. Trigger warning for transphobia, racism, and racist lives.